Hello, my name is Markus Bühler. I'm the McAfee Professor of Engineering at MIT, and today I'll be talking about AI and machine learning and materials design and manufacturing. Materials have multiple scales. If you think about uh, materials like sand, you can see that at the macro scale they look like a pile of sand, which we all see all the time. If we look closer, we can see the individual sand grains, and if we look even closer, we can see each grain actually looks like a little rock, and even closer with a very high fidelity microscope, we can actually see the internal structure of the sand and ultimately see the molecular arrangement of atoms in the silica structure. What we see is that materials have multiple scales and we can utilize these multiple scales as a new engineering design paradigm called materialomics. We can design materials at multiple scales, at all scales, from the nano to the macro and the other way around. We see these multi-scale design paradigms actually in nature. If we think about a spider web, we can think about muscle adhesion, muscle threads, we can see cells in the human body or in animals or in plants, or we can look at bone, which is a very tough material that's very hard to break. All these materials have hierarchical structures and the reason why they perform so well, like bone being a very tough material, is because they have internal defect, they have internal structures, which make these materials very resilient and very strong and very tough. It's all about hierarchical structures and patterns. And so the idea was, when we thought about creating a new design paradigm, creating paradigms to actually optimize these materials, that is to use convolutional neural networks to perhaps characterize relationships between structure and function. As we know, CNNs are very good at picking out features in an image for classification, for instance. We can use the same idea in relating these features at different scales, as you can see in the slide, to material properties, which is basically a very similar idea. We can also use machine learning very effectively to create models of materials that are more effective and more efficient and more accurate. Think about a spider web as shown on the left-hand side. We can encode critical information using variational autoencoders, for instance, in a reduced set of variables, and then use the other way around by decoding the information in a design paradigm. We can design new kinds of spider webs, new kinds of bone microstructures. These are very powerful ideas and you can think about a family of different machine learning methods that are now emerging in materials design and manufacturing design, which really range from traditional uh, neural networks, artificial neural networks, to deep convolutional neural networks, to having GANs, which are generative adversarial models that have multiple neural networks playing games with each other, to having multiple GANs playing game, games with each other. And so sort of the sky's the limit here in sort of imagining what kind of neural network formulations we can use in modeling materials, in modeling manufacturing processes. So CNNs are very powerful in characterizing material properties, especially fracture properties. I'm going to walk you through a case study we've done. So we know that hierarchical structures like seen in bone and nacre and seashells, which are really one of the toughest materials known on, on this planet, uh, these uh, materials derive their, addition, their exceptional functionality from these hierarchical structures. We can model that using physics simulations. Now these physics simulations can tell us that the more hierarchy we add, the more structure we add, the more complexity we add, we get better material performance. The challenge is to identifying what exactly are the optimal microstructures. So the way nature solves this problem is by using a combination of disparate properties, like a very stiff material, or a very soft material, and it creates patterns of stiff and soft materials. On bone, for instance, we have a protein called collagen, which is very soft, and we have a very brittle, very stiff material, which is the hydroxyapatite. And this contrasting property, by distributing these materials in patterns over space and time, we can create advanced material properties like very high toughness. So the problem is, how do we find these optimal distributions? Now, nature does it through evolutions, but it takes millions and billions of years. We don't have as much time. So the problem that we have posed now is to think about this as a game. And a couple years ago, there was some amazing work published on uh, human-made AI algorithms that are better than human players of games like Go or chess. And these games are very similar to the kind of design problem we have in materials design. We have a distribution of particles that have to be optimally arranged to create an optimal function, a desired function. So these methods can replace what we currently use on the left-hand side, you can see that, which are finite element methods. Finite element methods are great methods, but they're very expensive. They basically solve Newton's laws very accurately, but they take an extended period of time to actually conduct. So it's not very efficient to do design problems because optimization requires us to solve these finite element problems hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of times. So we have used this idea to create a machine learning model that really works with the patterns we see in materials and relating these patterns to functions. And the way this works is essentially we run a finite element simulation and or an experimental paradigm where we test for 
various microstructures what the performance looks like. We then train a CNN, a convolutional neural network, uh, to relate these patterns to function. And once the model has learned this, we can then use it as an optimization paradigm. And we can validate the model, of course, for a small enough system, we can actually conduct simulations in what we call brute force. In other words, we can solve the full problem for our possible design solutions explicitly using a fine element model, and we can relate that also to the machine learning model. And we've shown that this works really well. In other words, the machine learning model has really truly captured the physics of the relationships between microstructure and function. Uh, and this uh, paradigm is very exciting because now we can go to much bigger systems. Like here, we've looked at hierarchical designs. In other words, we have many, many different uh, stiff and soft particles, which in turn make new kinds of building blocks like shown here. So this is exactly the paradigm we see in bone and spider silk. Uh, you can kind of see a zoomed in view on these microstructures. So instead of having just stiff and soft, now we make new kinds of building blocks out of stiff and soft, kind of imagining a hierarchy of Lego building blocks, which then make new building blocks, which then make new building blocks. And this is a problem, obviously, that uh, using fine element simulation is basically intractable design to solve, but with machine learning we can actually solve this problem very effectively. And moreover, we can use combine this very, very well with advanced manufacturing techniques like additive manufacturing or 3D printing, where we can actually then make in the laboratory within just a couple hours design paradigms we have created, design solutions we've created, and then test them in the lab. And we've done this closed loop simulation, uh, optimization, and experimental testing paradigm, and confirmed in the laboratory that in fact the predictions, the optimizations we've done using the machine learning model can actually be validated and confirmed in the lab using 3D printing. Another way to do the optimization is to use genetic algorithms. Of course, genetic algorithms are sort of a model for nature's paradigm of solving iterations of design solutions. And again, as I said earlier, in nature this takes hundreds of millions of years a lot of times, a very long time. Engineers, we don't have as much time, and so genetic algorithms provide a really powerful way of doing that very quickly. And again, we can use this method very effectively to, to come up with design solutions for, say, very fracture-resistant materials or materials with certain optical properties or mechanical properties uh, or electronic properties. And this allows us then to um, come up with solutions that are very difficult to imagine for the human brain or other computational methods and a very, a very quick way of coming up with solutions for practice. And uh, we can again make this in, in 3D printing and test these kind of design solutions as well. So um, not only can we look at static properties, like relating a microstructure to a, to a property like fracture toughness or strength or elasticity, we can also relate the dynamics, the evolution of cracks. And of course, many times in engineering, we're interested in how things break, what is the dynamical evolution of fractures, how things actually snap apart, which that is important for designing materials that are resisting fracture, like needed in airplane or construction materials for roads or buildings and other things like this. So what we do here is we use a combination of high fidelity experimental work. This is some work I've done with Jamie Warner where we can actually watch atom by atom materials break. In a simulation we can use quantum mechanical simulations to very accurately capture the dynamical evolution of cracks. And we can combine these things in this multi-scale description of fracture and really go from the nano to the macro scale. And this gives us not only a single frame, a picture, but actually a movie of the fracture evolution, which we can then get, give to a machine learning algorithm, which then uh, records the history of fracture and learns the relationships between a previous frame, a previous microstructure set, and the next prediction of the microstructure, which continuously changes. So this is very exciting. And of course, can not only be applied to fracture, but potentially could be applied to many other engineering and science problems. We have the evolution of dynamical fields. It works really well. Uh, we can build training sets using molecular dynamic simulations from the ground up. Uh, we can then validate these using the machine learning model. And we've actually shown that the model can not only predict what it has learned very well, but can also predict scenarios that it has never been exposed to, like gradients of, of misorientations of crystalline structures, changes in the microstructure, and even very unusual grain boundaries, like we call twin grain boundary, which are very prominent design tool and so this is a grain boundary type, an internal defect in a material that the machine learning model has actually never seen in the training set, but yet it has learned, has captured the information so it can actually predict, like in a molecular dynamics simulation, like in a physics simulation, how a crack would interact with this type of grain boundary. So now we're going to shift gears and not only describe um, static materials or engineering materials, but actually go back to the very beginning of the talk when I talked about the biological systems which um, are materials like spider silk, or muscles, or cells, which uh, really speak the language of life and uh, use proteins and DNA to build themselves. So we have discovered that um, to describe the language of life, there's a very, very important relationship 
really between um, the, uh, the, the way sound is generated and the way materials are generated. So you think about materials, as we talked about, they have these multiple structural levels from the nanoscale to the macro scale, um, you know, starting from the DNA sequence and the protein microstructure um, all the way to the, um, to the structure of fibers and the spider web ultimately or the bone structure. And in sound or in music, we follow a very similar paradigm. We begin with simple sine waves, which are then modulated in time and space. Uh, these sine waves combined give rise to different timbres of instruments, uh, which then can play different melodies, different tones. And these can be overlaid and create an orchestral sound, just like the one you've heard in the background. And this idea of generating sound relates very, very closely, very intimately to the way materials are made. Let's think about how sound is generated conventionally. Well, conventionally, the way sound is generated really is using strings, like here in the harp or in a piano, we have a hammer hitting the piano. Um, or we can have drums, which are membranes, and these membranes vibrate. And so no matter what we do, we have some macroscopic objects that vibrate and they create excitations in the air, um, and then it creates beautiful tones, like shown in, the, in a guitar here. And the reason why these tones sound uh, beautiful is because these strings are usually tuned according to some sort of harmonic tuning which allows tones to be played against each other and sound nice to the human ear. So this kind of process is actually a very powerful way of getting information directly into our brain. You think about it like this, sound waves are generated by these vibrating strings, create pressure waves in the air which then connect to our ear and then the ear inside has a, a membrane that then connects to nerve cells which then ultimately connect directly to our brain. So this is a very direct way of getting data into our brain and you can see where I'm heading now because we can use um, natural systems like the spider web as a way of exploring how their vibrations might sound like or look like and use it as a new type of microscope, a new type of design paradigm to actually come up with new engineering designs. So you think about insects and insects actually are brilliant musicians, brilliant sound inspectors, because they use vibrations in the air, in the environment, as a way to communicate and to interact with the environment. You think about a wasp like shown here, they have antenna on the front of their head. These are used as a way of detecting very, very fine details of vibrations. Uh, you can think about stink bugs, um, uh, shown here in this picture, they have antenna as well, and these have very fine hair structures, which are vibration sensors. Similar thing happens for spiders. And so you can see that these universality vibrations and waves are very, very fundamental to understanding the world around us. In fact, we'll take a step back, you can see that molecules have what's called the wave-particle duality. We know that from quantum mechanics, we have sound, of course, which we've already talked about, is a hierarchical assembly of sine waves. And of course, we have the insect world and, the, and, and even the human world, which really relies very strongly on vibrations. Humans, um, of course, have ears, but insects have these multi-scale sensors and antenna that really provide them with the ability to very, very accurately sense vibrations. So, um, vibrations and waves can be described mathematically the, in the simplest way, in the most, most fundamental way, using sine waves, and that's the way we're using it. As so you can imagine now, building models of materials, instead of taking a look at a picture, we actually transform these structural informations into a sound wave collection that changes over time, uh, describing the evolution of the material, the structure of the material. And we can then translate material into sound and then manipulate the sound, sort of create new sounds, compose new sound, uh, compose new melodies, and then creating these melodies uh, translating them back into the material provides us with an opportunity to design materials using a very unconventional way. Um, now, how do we do that? Well, if you think about the structure of benzene, for instance, you open that chemistry textbook, uh, what you're going to see are, are pictures of graphene, uh, which are really uh, static pictures. They're basically drawings of the molecule, um, and uh, that really hasn't fundamentally changed from 1800 so on uh, to today, where basically these are cartoon structures. Now, this is not how molecules actually look like. We know that molecules are continuously moving and vibrating. In fact, these um, vibrations kind of remind you probably of the vibrations in a string, right? So in this uh, violin, for instance, you can see that uh, these strings actually is vibrating very, very rapidly, which creates the pressure waves, which we can then hear in our ears. Uh, and so very similar to the molecular vibrations, we have string vibrations, except they happen at different scales. And what we have done, developed an algorithm to actually use these molecular vibrations, compute them very accurately, compute their spectra, and transposing them into the audible range for the human ear so we can make them audible. And this way we have created uh, sound models of uh, many different kinds of biological systems from spider webs to proteins in cells to proteins in viruses. And this um, can be done systematically using an algorithmic approach actually to compute not only this kind of sound spectrum of music for individual proteins, but actually for all known proteins that are currently known to the human, to, to the human community. Um, uh, and these are all stored in what's called the protein data bank. With may have used the protein data bank as a data source to compute the vibrational spectrum for every known protein. Um, we have done this 
um, for the process of folding the protein so we can understand how the mechanics of protein actually works and how that can be expressed in a musical sense. And uh, by doing this, we now have a library available of the fundamental building blocks of life, which are ultimately the amino acids which are encoded by DNA. And so each amino acid actually has a unique fingerprint, audible fingerprint, that makes it uniquely audible. Um, each fingerprint of DNA of proteins can be seen as a note in a complex musical composition, which then ultimately translates into um, complex arrangements of musical structure. So what you see on this slide here is a, a picture of lysozyme expressed as an audible spectrum changing over time, basically creating a musical score that reflects that protein structure in musical space. So you can hear that. Instead of looking at the structure or looking at data, you can now hear the structure of this protein. We can also use this method to um, synthesize sounds in, a, in an app. We've created an app called the Amino Acid Synthesizer. It's a free app. You can get it on, on Google Play. And this app allows you to play music and actually compose your own DNA sequence, your own proteins, by translating the music you've created back into DNA sequences. These kind of um, relationships between material and sound uh, and sound and material allow us to solve this design pattern of materials in a very different way. In fact, we can not only do that uh, by hand, by the human brain, like in the app, we can actually do this using artificial intelligence methods as well by basically creating sounds of proteins for hundreds of thousands of different proteins and then feeding this as a training set into an AI algorithm that then creates new music based on what it has learned to design new proteins. And this is a very, very powerful way to basically understand the language of life, which is very difficult for the human brain to comprehend. But AI methods, of course, are very powerful and they can understand these relationships between structure, function, and folding very well. So this is a method that allowed us to basically compose new music, which then allowed us to make new proteins. These new proteins are uh, quite interesting because uh, these are proteins that nature has not yet invented, but we have made them using this AI method. And we haven't just come up with the sequence by writing it on a piece of paper, we actually have created music through the AI algorithm, which then we have translated back into the protein structure. And uh, these new protein structures can be uh, analyzed further with quantum mechanical methods, with uh, we call uh, simulated them using molecular dynamics, which is a very accurate way of describing the equilibrium structure of a, of a protein. We've also looked at the sequence, analyzed the sequence, and showed that this sequence that we have come up with through music is a sequence that nature has not yet invented. So it's a really new protein. Uh, we've made different families of these proteins, and we've also made it in the laboratory. So you can see on this picture here, we've made this particular protein in the lab to actually have a physical manifestation of sound. So this is the first time I think we've gone from uh, proteins to sound and then back from sound to protein but using AI as a method to creating new sound and thereby creating new material. Um, this method has also been applied to uh, predicting the, um, the sound spectrum of the coronavirus pathogen of COVID-19 um, and we've all seen the pictures of this virus of course which looks like this has the spike protein sticking out on the outside which gives its name the, the crown the crowns in this, in this virus. We have created a musical reflection, musical representation of these crown proteins um, by looking at the structure of the folding. And this is very exciting because it allows us to access the information stored in the DNA in a different way. So if you conventionally look at the DNA sequence, you can have pages and pages of DNA letters, which really don't make any sense to the human brain. We can look at them, but they don't really make any sense. But by listening to the score, you can actually make sense of this and you have another way of studying this protein structure. So what we found with this method, with this research, is that music is everywhere and matter is sound and also sound is matter. And so we've created a way using artificial intelligence to design new materials. So recapping this, um, essentially we have gone in the beginning from starting to look at patterns by using deep neural deep convolutional neural networks to understand how patterns relate to structure and function and properties. We've used it to optimize materials. We've also used a method to use at the look at the history of patterns and how they evolve to describe um, field evolutions of materials, like in fracturing. So we can not only see how a one structure relates to function, but also see how structures evolve in nature. And that method obviously has applications very widely in engineering, in, in engineering beyond just looking at fracture. You can imagine applying this to corrosion, applying it to fields in nature, um, modeling weather and climate and many other things like this. And we've also used a very unconventional way of translating the molecular vibrations, the structures of molecules at a very, very elementary scale to sound, and then using sound as a way of creating new music, either by human composition or by using AI and machine learning methods to then design new materials that nature has not yet invented.